All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Just to let you know, there is a pile here. Um, this is for your peer reviews. If you want to turn it in in the um, paper form, if you already turn it in online, don't worry about it. Okay. If you missed class on Friday and you didn't email me to get the alternative assignment, we can talk after class. Um, and we haven't already talked on email. I feel like I got to talk to a lot of you all weekend and that was lovely. So I'm glad that you guys reached, some of you reached out about your papers and I did my best, best to get back to everybody. So um, that's how crazy my life is. <laughs> Um, I did have a really cool thing happen I want to share with you on um, yesterday. I was at um, Berkeley and I gave a lecture in the um, Morrison room, which is this gorgeous part of the library. It has these like Tudor ceilings and um, if you ever get to the Berkeley campus, make sure you go to the library, to the Morrison reading room because it's one of the most beautiful library spaces I've ever seen. And students can just, and you could, you're, I mean, technically, you're UC students, right? You could just go sit in that library and read, and it's amazing. So, highly recommend it. All right, we're moving on from poetry. Aww, we're all sad, I know. But I hope you guys enjoyed getting to know some of these lost ladies of um, the 1800s. As you may have noticed, I know besides Emily Dickinson, who during her time period was lost, I do have a focus in, in this semester on, on this quarter on um, women that have been forgotten a great deal, um, who are not really recognized as part of the canon. And so the book we're looking at now is just gonna represent fiction for us because we're not gonna have time to do both Anne and the Morgansons, although I will um, highly recommend reading Anne since it's free and it's online. Um, we're gonna be reading um, this book because it's a book that isn't often um, canonized or taught, um, and it wasn't well received when it first came out. We're going to talk about why. So this is the reading schedule for the book. Um, the um, We're going to begin talking about the first um, chapters on Wednesday, so please make sure you've read up to page 54 on Wednesday, um, Then, which is all about childhood, and I'll be kind of giving you the prep for that, so you'll be ready to meet Cassandra and Veronica um, and all of the other characters of this book. Then in, um, on Friday, we'll be reading chapters um, 19 through 25. You guys will all get really good at your no Roman numerals this, during this era. If you need some translations, I can tell you, but the page numbers are there too. Okay. Um, then on mon next Monday, a week from today, we'll read through um, page 201, um, chapter 32, and then we'll read um, the last bit next by next Wednesday. So that means you need to have read it by that day. Does that make sense? So this coming Wednesday, read up to 54, because we will be talking about it in detail. I'll be looking at passages, so you'll need to have your books with you. So I encourage you to take notes in your book. If you have a book that you feel like you don't want to write in, bring sticky notes so you can put your notes in. We also on Wednesday will begin talking about literary terminology and fictional terminology. These are the terms like the poetic terminology that I'd like you to use when we're talking about it. Just the basics. We will be talking about the protagonist today. What's the protagonist? The main character, the main character right? So these are terms that you're very familiar with. We're just going to go over them. Also, I want to point out that you can use poetic terminology to talk about fiction and vice versa. Okay? You, they're not like only in that genre. It's just um, they clump around that genre because there's a lot more use of it. But you can certainly uh, point out a metaphor um, in, a, um, in a chapter of Elizabeth Stoddard's The Morgansons. Any questions about the reading schedule? I do, before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about attendance and also um, the extra credit um, assignment that we have. So um, attendance, this is really for the video, but also to you in the room. Um, attendance is um, really important in these sessions because you will fall behind when we're reading something this quickly. So I highly recommend not missing a class, including discussion. That is a required part of this class. 
So it's really important that you come and do the activity in class. We had an alternative assignment last week for obvious reasons. And I do understand why there was a lot of, a lot of people were missing last week because it was crazy what was going on. And I really, my heart goes out to all of you um, for what we've been through as a community. It's, um, as Connie and I realized when we were trying to buy coffee without wallets last week, we were all, you know, internally affected by that, even though I was like, oh, I'm fine. And then all of a sudden we're like forgetting things and, you know, it, it affects you, this kind of stress. Kind of like the way COVID affected us, like the, you know, the, the changes, these big, awful things happen. So I completely understand that. But I don't want to, I don't want you to add to your stress. If you can, you feel, you know, like um, now that things have changed and think we are, um, I don't know how to say it. Now that that's not longer, no longer a, an active threat for us right now, um, I would love for us to gather in person again. Um, so on Wednesday, please come having read, please come in person having read the first section of um, the Morgansons. Okay, does that make sense, you guys? Okay. Plus, I like to see your faces and have a real life conversation um, because then I know you're interacting with me. It's not as fun on, you know, Zoom or when you're recording, when you're just watching a recording. Okay. So if you look at page five, you will see that this book begins with the line, that child, said my Aunt Mercy, looking at me with indigo-colored eyes, is possessed. That is quite an interesting way to start a novel. Um, one thing that I want you to pay attention to is, as we read this is what it was like in the Victorian era. Um, we know a little bit from reading the poetry, but how does this move away from the norms of Victorian era, especially gender norms for female characters? And we will be talking about that throughout. There's a lot of clues in this first sentence. Number one, the aunt's name is Mercy. Number two, it's not in this line, but within the next um, couple of paragraphs, we learn the protagonist's name is Cassandra. Does anyone know who the character, the Greek character Cassandra is? Yes. Cassandra was cursed by Apollo to um, see the future, but nobody believed anything she said. So she was like, everything's going to come. Uh, I think it was the war, the Trojan War Trojan that she um, had, um, prophesied. And everybody was like, that's not going to happen. And then like, it happened, whatever. And she was like, yeah. Exactly. Good. So pay attention to that. There's a reason why the aunt's name is Mercy, mm -hmm. right? Very purita puritanical. Anyone ever read Young Goodman Brown? No? By Wait, Hawthorne? Was, was that the one with about the, the, the Scarlet guys? Letter? Have you read The Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne? Okay. So Hawthorne wrote short stories too, and he read The Young Goodman Brown, which is an allegory, but it takes place of, um, in the Puritan times. And it's um, about a man basically who loses his faith, but it's it's a um, he dances with the devil in the process, literally in the woods. So it's a it's a really it's a good short story. It's one of my favorites by Hawthorne, but um, it's super fun to teach because it has every act, it has everything about allegories within it, and it le and it ends with a really um, open ending where you're like, I don't know, what, did it really happen? Did it not? You know, like you're like, wow, what happened? But all the characters in that novel, in that short story, um, in most of the writing during this time that's about New England has names like Mercy. Why is that? Why would that be important? The, diff the, re you know, the difference between the name Cassandra and the name Mercy. Just think about it. Yes. Well, it sets Cassandra up as like opposite or um, excluded from the very kind of Christian, very um, either puritanical or um, descended of puritanical era. Very good. Um, society. From the beginning, she is other. She yeah. is not a part of the norm, right? And that's really important from the first page, from the first sentence, uh, because being a possessed child in a very religious society is not a really good, you know, not a really good statement, right? Mm -hmm. So pay attention to that. So she's 
Stoddard's considered is now considered one um, to be um, one of the most strikingly original voices of the mid 19th century American novel. So this is nowadays people look back and can see the art in this in this novel and how it do, um, is different from its contemporaries. She but she was also during her lifetime compared to Balzac, Tolstoy, George Eliot, Nathaniel Hawthorne and the Bronte sisters, I apologize Bronte sisters for not putting the double dot on the E um, during her lifetime. But her works were not widely read when they were published and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, her novel doesn't fit into the two norms of the, of the 1800s for novels. It is not a romantic novel, which was a pre-Civil War format, um, which is what you see in Scarlet Letter. And it is not a realistic novel, uh, um, which is what you see in the latter half of the 18th century. Um, we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the pre and post Civil War, Civil War is right in the middle there of the, of the century in the 1860s. Um, it happens right when her book comes out. And um, it is, she's in this kind of never, um, this world that doesn't adhere to standards, either gender norms, um, uh, form, the, the form of the buildings Roman, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Uh, she doesn't adhere to that completely. Um, and the form of um, how novels were written during her time period. She's in between both. So the Bildungsroman is a class of novel that depicts and explores the manner in which the protagonist develops morally and psychologically. So the German word Bildungsroman means novel of education or novel of information. Um, Roman means novel, and Bildungs is like the the um, the, the lessons, the lessons that are that are that are taught. So there's a, usually a, a hero of some sort, um, traditionally a male hero. And just so you know, there's still Bildungs romans being written today. This is a, a very um, well known form of the novel. Um, in fact, the quest of the hero is often a Bildungs roman, which you probably are familiar familiar with all over um, society. So there's usually a hero, traditionally male, who through the quest of growing up acquiesces to societal norms. Um, the form began to change during the 1800s. So um, when the German versions of this came out, um, there were two different forms. There was the Bildungsroman and the Kunstlerroman. So the Bildungsroman is a general coming of age story where the Kunstlerroman is, Kunstler is artist, um, so it's an artistic coming of age story, which usually ends in suicide. It's a very uplifting book, okay? Um, Jack London has a really famous Kunstler Roman called Martin Eden. Anyone ever read that? Probably not, yeah, okay. Um, so Stoddard's book has been called a feminist Bildungsroman, and that's really important. That's something we're gonna be thinking about as we're reading it. Why would it be considered a feminist Bildungsroman? So here she is again. I love how pissed off she looks in this picture, right? It, it's, I think it's representative of the way that she thought, the way that she thought about someone taking her picture. Just remember that when you were getting your photograph during this era, it wasn't like today. Like you would have to sit there a long time where they set up the, the photo and let it, process. So she's sitting there a good 20, 30 minutes waiting for it to happen. And that's what her face did because she was annoyed, right? Good. So she lived from 1823 to 1902. She was born in the seacoast town of Mataposet. I'm saying that wrong. Anyone know how to say that word correctly? I will learn. Um, she was born on, um, she lived on Buzzards Bay. And the novel is set in this town, however, its name has been changed to Surrey. So Surrey is the name of the town where the novel is set, but it is based autobiographically on the place where she grew up. So all of these places you see in the novel are based on autobiographical places in her biography. And we will be talking about that as we read through them. She was the daughter of a wealthy shipbuilder. In fact, he even, um, their shipbuilding firm um, where they built the, um, the ship that Melville um, saved, sailed on 
when he went to the South Seas, he went to the Marquesian Islands, he wrote a famous book called Taipei, um, which was um, so much more successful than um, Moby Dick during his lifetime, which you probably know Melville now for his novel Moby Dick. Yes? Heard of the guy? Yeah? Good. Um, so nobody thought that was a very good novel when it came out. Right? Now it's considered like one of the best American novels. They thought Taipei was the best novel. Um, which had to do with colonizing the Marquesian Islands in many ways. Um, but also, um, in fact, it's what drew later generations of writers like Jack London and Charming Kittredge London to travel to the South Seas because this kind of romanticized idea of what the South Seas were like pre-colonization um, was created. And because of these people traveling to the Marquesian Islands, bringing their diseases, um, it pretty much annihilated half the population. So, um, so she was a daughter of a wealthy shipbuilder. However, her family's wealth was unstable. So her father kept going bankrupt, even though he was part of this, you know, um, they weren't good with money. So she was never really accepted as a legitimate member of the local aristocracy. And as an adult, she took a lot of pleasure in satirizing the stuffiness of her native town. So the reason why The Morgansons, which is her first novel, is set in Surrey, um, which is obviously the fictional version of this town she grew up in, um, is in a way satirizing the environment she grew up in. So she, as a child, she read everything that she could get her hands on. And she was lucky enough to have a congregational min minister named Thomas Robbins, who becomes Dr. Snell in um, the uh, early part of um, the Morgansons, so pay attention to Dr. Snell, um, who let her use his extensive library of books, which contained the classics of the 18th century literature. Uh, also a lot of um, religious literature, which she didn't really care for as much. By the mid um, 1850s, when she began publishing her writing, she'd also read a wide range of contemporary European and American authors, such as George Sand, the Bronte sisters, Emerson, Poe, Thoreau, and Dickens. And Dickens' uh, most famous Bildung's Roman is David Copperfield. Anyone ever read David, David Copperfield? Okay. Wow. Okay. I never know what you guys are reading from the 1800s, so it's always good to do a little poll. Yeah. Um, did, Dickens, do you, have you read anything by Dickens besides uh, a Christmas Carol, which you've probably seen many versions of. Like, is that the one? Is that the one with Bunbury in it? Was that? Is that the one with Bunbury in it? The guy who they make up who's dead, but he's not real. The the way oh um, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, Bunbury. Bunbury and um, David Bunbury. Copperfield. Yeah. I um, I. Think it's Oscar it's the of being yes. in this, that's, that's Oscar Wilde. It's Wilde. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's, um, you also, you also probably um, have come across Great Expectations before. Yeah. 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 It's Hamish, the lady that never leaves her home since she got stood up on her, her uh, wedding day. Just mm -hmm. creepy character. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. So. Dickens is somebody to pay attention to because he is one of the most popularized um, figures um, in England that she would have been reading. So um, what's also important to notice about Elizabeth Stoddard is in, by Victorian standards, she was considered too much, meaning she didn't adhere to gender standards for her day. A woman was meant to be um, a little sickly, a little, um, you know, completely constricted by a corset. Has anyone ever seen what a corset looks like in real life? It's like the, the, your waist is literally, you can put your hands around it because it is cinched so tight. Even pregnant women were forced to use corsets. So just so you know how constrictive it was, those fainting spells you see, yes? Sorry, can I play devil's advocate for the corset? <laughs> you can. Yeah, Sorry. At the same time, like the weight of the clothing would really dig into you if you didn't have that support. Yes. To redistribute the stress. 
you're right. So the clothing was made to fit under a, um, uh, to fit over a corset, and it was heavy, right? And that did that did assist in that. But all of those factors um, slowed women down from being able to participate in things like if you think of, of Louisa May Alcott, like we were talking about on Friday, running, right? with these heavy skirts on and heavy clothes we're talking like 20 pounds of stuff that you're wearing right and she's still running right so i want you to think about the, the body constrictiveness that's happening for women also this is when anorexia is first recorded as a um as a disease that obviously was happening before this time but it's first it's first diagnosed um, any all food disorders begin being diagnosed during this time. Um, the ideal look for, for a woman was that she looked um, like she had tuberculosis, like she had rosy cheeks and glittering eyes and she was frail and a little, a little winded, a little, oh, my heart, like that idea of being passive and um, not having an outward um, energetic personality. Right? Obviously, women didn't all fit into this stereotype, um, and I'm giving you the gender norms of the day. Yes? Um, I think there was like, a trend of richer, like, aristocratic women who would say that they were sick with tuberculosis and then go on vacation for like, a very long time. They, they would say they were sick? Yeah, they were like, I need to get good air, and then they would visit other places and like, rest. Yeah, so it was a good way to get away from your home for a while, right? Like, remember, Helen Hunt Jackson had tuberculosis, and that's why she ended up in Colorado. There were places where you would be sent where the air was better for the conditions of that. Uh, but you're right, there were people that, that lied about that as a way to go to a different place as well and have it, they would have it for a very long time. If, if you had wealth, you could do that kind of, that kind of thing, yes? Um, I don't know if you know this, but how does the beauty standard It doesn't make any sense. No. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if I was just missing something. Yeah, kind of like side saddles. Like women, when they rode, rode on side saddles because it was unattractive for women to ride astride. However, that whole idea of riding side saddle came from um, a court in England in the 1700s, uh, 1600s. Um, one of the, uh, the king's wife was disabled. And so the only way she could ride was side saddle. And so all the courtly ladies wanted to ride side saddle to be like the queen. Well, it wasn't because it was you know, not ladylike to ride astride, it was just because they wanted to be like the queen and then it stuck as a, as a trend um, for 300 years and wasn't changed until the early 1900s. So these kinds of ideas were, we just get stuck into a, um, a mindset. The Victorian age was a time of a lot of restrictions for women, but ironically, it was also a time of a lot of pushes against that. And it's when women's rights started to be, um, you know, temperance movement, the um, idea of the Seneca Falls, you know, that actually happened during that era because of these tight restrictions that were happening. So there's good and bad to what was happening at the time. And what I am giving you are stereotypes. This is not how women actually were in society at all times. These are the things that she's writing against. Yes and yes. Um, I think the, okay, my back's up. Um, can I go after? Yes. Um, uh, just a question, like how prominent was like this kind of like celebrity culture and authorship like associated with each other? Like was anyone like, oh, this this author's not lady like, well, uh, tell our girls to read this book? Like, was that a thing? Was it a thing that she wasn't ladylike enough to be an, an author? Like, uh, people would be discreet from reading her books because she didn't fit the social norms? Yes, and her, her books didn't fit. Like, the, 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 more importantly, the people within her books didn't fit the social norms as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's a reason why readers might not have understood the characters as much. So that, yes, but you're right. Um, you were expected to behave in a certain way as, a, you know, as an author. Um, 
but she wasn't a famous author during her day. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Did you have something to add to it? Um, I think during, I'm not sure if it's during the time, um, the Wellington book series, but like, I know around the era there was this popular um, story about like a really tragic love story of a woman who died of tuberculosis at the end. Um, and I think it really like blew up at the time. So a lot of women were going for like a sickly, de uh, delicate, frail woman. Yes, it was very popular as an image um, during this mid-century, um, 18th century time period. Yes. Was that kind of like part of like the twist of Dracula? Because it's like, oh, yes. this woman, she's, she's so, look at her, she's so fainting and, and she's wasting away in bed. Oh, how romantic. Oh, she's dead. Oh, she's a vampire. Yes, that's where some of these monster characters come from. I mean, that would be a wonderful class to talk. We, we're going to get sidetracked if we go down that route. So there's a lot to say about that. But yes, yeah, great observation. Monsters are always depicted. They're always based on uh, real life ideas. Yes. Uh, just a side note, there's a vampire film class at Davis that's offered every spring quarter. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of talk about Dracula and like the new woman movement. Like they go really deep into that if anyone's interested. That's awesome. I'm so glad that class exists. Good. You should totally take it. It's the, awesome. It's the, the new yeah. woman. So what happens, like just to build off of that, what happens after, you know, so we're talking about the late 1800s is when the new move, woman movement happens. And that's where the, in the early 1900s, in the eight, late 1800s into the early 1900s is when all of these things get challenged and, and change. And so women started not obeying as in mass. Um, and not adhering to these gender stereotypes. So the, one of the people I wrote about, Charmaine Kittredge London, was a new woman. And this, it's, it's really like to see her diaries for the 18, like late, 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, is really interesting because it's very, um, the standards are very different for women during this time period. And then of course they retract during the war periods that happen afterwards. But um, from the late 1800s to the um, World War I, and especially World War II, women's freedoms get greatly increased. And that, that would be a great class. I'm gonna try to teach that class. All right, so um, she did go to school to a um, Wheaton Female Seminary, which was one of the best schools that she could go to. Uh, but just like Emily Dickinson, who is alive at the same time, right? They're in a very similar time period. In fact, when Mr. Higginson went, went over to her house to when he met um, Emily Dickinson and he talked to her about, you know, he, he had a meeting with her after she reached out to him about getting published. Um, he explained to a friend, to his wife, the only way you'll understand her household is if you have read an Elizabeth Stoddard novel. So that'll get, so her, her house was like the households that um, Elizabeth Stoddard was depicting in the Morganism. So something to pay attention to. Um, but both of them, when they were in their seminaries, um, refused to accept evangelical Protestant. Oh my gosh. Protestantism. Protest Protest Protestantism. Thank you. I can't, my, my brain gets stuck on words, sorry. That one is not coming out today, so thank you. Um, the, it's, it's my stutter. You know, everybody has like stuff like that. That's my stutter. Um, so she, um, she did not um, act, she did not say that she was saved, just like Emily Dickinson at school wouldn't, you know, stand up and say she was saved. She did not and she would not. She had her own personal relationship with God, just like Emily Dickinson. So by the mid, um, so um, she had a personality that by Victorian standards was considered too much, like we were talking about. She didn't adhere to gender standards of her day and she was extroverted venturesome and aggressive, and she considered the fact that she was outspoken a virtue. So um, she was abrasive and blunt in letters, and um, she, <coughs> excuse me, she put those characteristics in her characters as well. So what you'll see in Cassandra is those very characteristics, and they're looked upon in a positive way for um, the protagonist. Not within the environment, but from the point of view of the protagonist. So here is Richard Stoddard um, in 1851 at age 29, after some hesitation. She married a poet named Richard Stoddard, and he was from Connecticut. Um, 
and had moved to New York to become a starving artist, just like Keats. Um, he remained a starving um, artist his whole life because he never had a very successful career. Um, they had three children together, two of which died young. Nathaniel Hawthorne helped Richard secure the appointment of Inspector of Customs at the Port of New York, and he kept his job until 1870. And today, he's largely forgotten except for the fact that he is the one who got, who got Melville a job at the Customs House. Anyone re ever read Bartleby the Scrivener? Oh, I don't know. I prefer not to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the famous quote. Yeah, that is. Um, so he wrote that while he was working there. Do you guys not read Melville? No. Herman Melville? What's that? Herman Melville? Yes, Herman Melville. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was another big, you know, uh, author during this time period. Uh, but we're not, we're not worrying about men right now. We're worrying about women. So beginning in the 1860s, their home in New York City became that literary hub that I was telling you about on Friday, um, where they hosted these salons. But what's important to note is these literary um, people that she was interacting with, that she was showing her work to, were not of the same caliber of her. Um, so they were kind of, they weren't as talented in regards to, according to critics, um, and so the advice they would give her about her work, so if you look at the first version of the Morgansons versus the last version of it, because it was republished in 1889, um, or her later books, which we'll talk about in a second, they are quite different. She takes less risks as she gets she gets, you know, as her books aren't receiving a wide audience, and so she stops taking these risks. She stops being, um, putting her artistic ideas first and puts readership before that. So we see that shift in her work, and a lot of that has to do with who's reading her work, who's giving her feedback, and they are also off, they are also writers who are not taking risks. So her writing career, um, she, for a decade, she wrote poems, stories, sketches for periodicals. In fact, you can find her poems on Poetry Foundation if you're interested in seeing them. Um, she contributed to a bi-monthly column um, at the San Francisco newspaper called Daily Alta California. And that's where she reviewed contemporary authors such as the Brontes, George Sand, Tennyson, and Emerson. So she, and also a lot, those are the ones she liked. There was a lot she didn't like. So this is where she kind of felt, um, she felt this authority to have a critical voice. And these, um, I'm gonna try to find some copies of these so you guys can read them, but the, her voice is, is not passive at all. It's very critical, almost like in, a, in, a, um, in what you would see as atypical of a gendered, a, a male gendered voice during this era. And so it's a, it's a good way to see um, how she was like crafting her style, which would later become the Morgans. Um, she became a keen, key, a keen witness to the issues of antebellum social of the antebellum social scene. So that's post World War, sorry, World War, um, Civil War um, scene in politics, religion, temperance, and feminism. And all of these issues are coming up in this novel. The Morgansons was published in 1862, and it mixes literary modes while challenging repressive gender conventions. Her second and third novels, Two Men, which was published in 1865, and Temple House, which was published, published in 1867, switched to a male protagonist and became less experimental. All of her novels take place in settings based on where she grew up, and The Morgansons is the most autobiographical. So you'll see the most ties to her, her life. So her style. She is considered a transitional figure among New England writers. So she combines Hathorian romance. So think of the depiction of Hester Prynne in The Scarlet Letter, um, which was published just a little over a decade before her book in 1850, uh, with the regional realism that would become popular in the late 19th century, which is um, they would, when they came out, is when her books got reissued. And it's Dean Howe Young, sorry, Dean, Dean, uh, Dean William Howe. Um, was the kind of the, the head of that um, that movement, and they chose a De William Dean Howe. Sorry, I always mix his, his words. Uh, William Dean Howe's 
is um, kind of, he was kind of the, um, the lead figure of the, um, the realist movement that's happening at the end of the 1800s. And they took, they saw in her style kind of a precursor of what they were doing. And so they tried to kind of take her under the, the you know, they tried to republish her, get people reading her as kind of their foremother. Uh, but she didn't like that. She, she thought that was bullshit, basically, and would not kind of put her name next to theirs. She said she was doing her own thing. Um, she was very fiercely independent um, and didn't like the idea that they were just kind of using her name. Um, even though it did make her book come out again, be reissued. And it's only since been reissued twice. Uh, there's this one. Uh, there's also a 1970s edition. Um, and that's it of the reissues of this book. Um, Hawthorne was her distant relative. And when the book came out, she sent him a review copy. And he thought it was very, very good. There's a, um, there's a letter between the two of them that, it, that survives that, that, um, from him to her, which is really interesting. All right, so when it was published, like I said, it was um, this right when news of the Union Army's disastrous defeat. Uh, it was 10 days after the publication of her book. Um, so she said, the Morgansons was my bull run, um, which was one of the, this disastrous defeat uh, for the Union Army. And she thought that that's what crippled her sales. So you'll see in common, like today, um, people who had books that came out in 2020, I had two, right? They talk about, you know, COVID ruined my book sales, the pandemic, you know, and you feel silly complaining about it because there was a pandemic, right? But that's like a common, like people who had books that came out in 2020, this, this is a marker for those books, right? That sales obviously were quite low if your book came out in March 2020, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a similar thing that was happening. Everyone was deeply affected by what happened at Bull Run. And, and so they weren't as interested in reading fiction at that time. Um, the book was re-released in 1889, like I just said, to a little more success. But because the novel didn't fit into the way scholars conceive of novels of the 1800s, so pre and post Civil War, it has all but been forgotten, except for with feminist um, uh, critics. So let's talk a little bit about what you're gonna be reading. So chapters one through 11, pages five through 54, is really based on the childhood of Cassandra, the protagonist. So um, she goes by Cassie as well. Like we mentioned in the beginning of class, her name's important. Um, it's um, modeled off the Trojan priestess dedicated to the god of Apollo and fated by him to utter true prophecies but never be believed. And this character is very much modeled on um, Elizabeth Stoddard herself. We um, will follow her throughout the novel as she gains awareness about the world around her and her relationship to that world. From her unique point of view as a non-normative, um, gender normed um, woman during this era. Her sister, who you'll meet in this section, is named Veronica, often called Very, which is, you know, a really fitting nickname for um, her elusive elf elfin kind of personality. She's part angel, part devil. She's defiant, but she's also vulnerable. So she's she's kind of um, uh, she's both extremes at the same time. Um, and she is modeled off of um, uh, Stoddard's own sister who died young. I want you to pay attention to the differences between the worlds of child and adult in this section. Um, and the parents and grandparents that are, that are depicted in this section are also, they resemble the real life counterparts that, you're, that, um, are, that exist in her biography. But her stories and novels aren't just embellished personal stories. It's really important to say that. Instead, they are a fictional space in which she explored the types of and impediments to female power during this era. I am so good on time today. All right, so your homework is going to be to read the Morgansons, chapters 1 through 11, pages 5 to 54. I expect you to have read it and you're ready to talk about it. You will be expected to talk in class. Please come ready to talk. And I will, I will go over the terminology before um, on um, Wednesday when we begin class. 
and then we will begin the discussion based on some questions that I'll put forward. Any um, questions before um, we leave? Yes? Did you say that the extra credit was due? I didn't. Um, I'm going to have it due on Friday. This Friday. This Friday. Okay. Yes. So I haven't posted it yet because I wanted to just remind you that you can write a poem um, about any of the poets that we've already read. Um, like my first draft that I read to you guys on Friday. Um, so please do so and you'll get extra credit towards your um, uh, your participation grade. Yes? Are there any requirements for length or form? No, there are not requirements. I do, um, one thing I do want to say though is please put effort into the composition of the poem. And if you need help on, you know, ideas for writing a poem, I would love to give you some poetry assignment if you're interested. Um, but you do need to try. You can't just be like, there was a lady named Helen Hunt Jackson. No limerick. I'm just kidding. If you can make a really good limerick, go for it. Yes. Can we write it from like for the perspective of that poet? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Or you can write in their style, or you can write about that person. That's what I did is like their deaths, right? Like whatever is interesting to you. I always write a poem about what's interesting to you, what you feel, okay? All right, you guys, good job today. Sorry, it was mostly me talking, but I will, if you have questions, stay after. Otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday in person.